With that said, I would um, like to bring Mo uh, uh, Maki up to the microphone. And so she will be, um, she is the mentor of our first presenter and she's going to say a few words. So I'm going to step away. Awesome. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Aloha ka kakayaka. My name is Maki Morinoe. I'm a fourth generation Kama'aina of Holu'aloa. I lived through the lenses of my family's immigrant history as Japanese American settlers, impacted by World War II, Executive Order 9066, the first generation impacted by the birth of Oha, breathing Hawaiiana back into our community. I chair an organization called Hulipak. It's an acronym for Help Uplift Leaders of Integrity. PAC stands for Political Action Committee. I'm humbled to be considered and asked to introduce Hannah Hartman today. Because our island is big, regretfully, I could not deliver a lay and uh, introduce you, Hannah, in person. Uh, yet the Zoom platform has opened up opportunities for a conscious ripple effect, creating possible uh, possibilities worldwide, including the birth of Huli PAC for our island. I want to express my deepest gratitude towards Hannah's advisor, Lisa Canale. Uh, we are grateful you allowed UH Hilo to add Huli Pack to your menu for internship opportunities. Uh, it facilitates an opportunity for both this organization and the students to gain leverage to uh, access real world, real time problem solving, giving our young leadership a place to shape their future narrative. Uh, we hope many young leaders consider Huli Pak in the future to move this island towards an indigenously progressive Ahupua'a system, towards a regenerative and equity-based system, while being unapologetically climate resilient, placing greater importance on circular economics before offshore investors, a future for all life, propelling us to a radically Pono lifestyle on Hawaii Island. Hannah Hartman is a scholar activist from Los Angeles, California, traditional Tongva territory. She received her bachelor's of science in environmental science and management with a focus on ecological restoration and minors in geospatial analysis, wild land soil science, and fire ecology from Humboldt State University, uh, which is in unceded Wiyot land. Hannah is about to complete her master's in science in tropical conservation, biology, and environmental science from the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Hannah actively serves on several boards and committees, is involved in numerous community organizations and spends her free time surfing, disc golfing, or with good company. Well, Hannah, um, much of her work uh, involves grassroots biorestoration. She wants to make it clear that the solution to environmental degradation and the climate crisis is giving land back and making reparations. After graduating, she will co-found an organization dedicated to cleaning up Aina using Pono biorestoration techniques. Hannah is passionate about systemic change and hopeful for a sustainable future. Uh, before I hand the mic over to Hannah, I wanted to close with a quote from uh, Greta Thunberg. You are never too small to make a difference. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then and only then, hope will come. Mahalo Piha. And Hannah, it is an honor to know you, support you, and work alongside you. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui Maki. That was such a thorough introduction. I'm like, I really, I really appreciate you and your mentorship. Is there anything I need to do? Oh, yeah. also, I was waiting to cough until after you finished talking. <laughs> <laughs> And I have water because I don't think I can get through 30 minutes of talking without <laughs> drinking at least twice.
Where is this? There we go. Can everyone on Zoom see that okay? Oh, groovy. You should be able to search. Okay, really, we're gonna test click. Okay, test click, check. <laughs> All right, aloha mai kako, o hana koui no, no Los Angeles, traditional Tongva territory Mayao. Noho ao mahilo, he hamana ao. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Hartman. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California, traditional, um, traditional Tongva territory. And I'm now wrapping up my master's in tropical conservation biology and environmental science. And I now call Hilo and this Aina my home. It's an incredible privilege. I'm very, very honored. And so what I did during my master's is exactly what I wanna to talk to you all about today. My title is Aligning with Fungi to Heal the Aina and Kuli the System. Before I move on, I have a lot of ohana or family tuning in from the continent. So I'm gonna do my very best at translating any of the olelo Hawaii or the Hawaiian words that I use today. Okay, to give us a bit of direction for my talk, I'm going to start by breaking down my title. I'll then give another land acknowledgement and a call to action. I'll give a brief history of the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom. I'll narrow it down a bit and talk about US military pollution on Oahu specifically. I'll get into a brief history of the Red Hill crisis. And then I'll get into what I did for my professional internships with the Sierra Club of Hawaii and Huli Pak. And then I'll wrap it all up with what's next and a bit about the road forward. So aligning with fungi to heal the aina and huli the system. Aligning with fungi, what does it mean to actually partner with another form of biological life in a way that cares for both us and them? In a lot of the bioremediation spaces that I'm a part of, people often refer to working with biological life as using them, but would you ever say that you are using your grandmother to borrow her car? That is messed up, and I really hope that none of us are doing that. But we can cultivate that relationship and then ask humbly to borrow her car. And so the same thing applies with fungi. We can create the best possible environmental conditions for those fungi to thrive in, and only then can we humbly ask them to clean up our contamination. This word aina really refers to the reciprocal relationship between the land and sea that feed and us as humans whose kuleana or responsibility it is to malama aina, to caretake this place. And then this word huli really means to turn or to change. I spend a lot of my free time in activism spaces and the common mycelial thread, if you will, between these spaces is the need for large scale systematic reform. Again, we can never overstate the importance of doing a land acknowledgement. And just in case people trickled in after the one that I just did this morning, we are located on unceded traditional Kanaka Maoli ancestral homelands. Hilo has several meanings, including first night after the new moon or to braid or twist. Since time immemorial, Kanaka Maoli have been and continue to be deeply intertwined with these lands. My call to action today. I urge the state of Hawaii, the county of Hawaii, and the University of Hawaii system to give land back to Kanaka Maoli and Kanaka Oivi and aid in the restoration of the Hawaiian kingdom. To be a good settler in this place, we must join the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. So it would be entirely inappropriate for me to talk about the pollution of this place without touching on the origins of that contamination. So the Kingdom of Hawaii was illegally overthrown on January 17th, 1893. Numerous injustices of course occurred before this, but in the interest of time, this is the only one that I'm going to be focusing on. The coup was staged by the Committee of Safety, a 13 member annexation group. And this group was largely made up of American businessmen. They were descendants from Anglo-Judeo-Christian missionaries, and they had some serious stake in the sugarcane plantain industry. So these men were growing their power in the form of land ownership and financial capital. Keep in mind, private property was not a thing in Hawaii prior. And so with these new imposed systems, these men were seriously growing their power. As a rebuttal to this, Queen Liliuokalani, the reigning monarch at the time of the overthrow, 
proposed a constitution that would give Native Hawaiians the legal right to vote. As a rebuttal to this, and with, through the conspiracies of the U.S. Minister to the Hawaiian Kingdom, in partnership with that Committee of Safety and backed by the U.S. military, troops landed in Hawaii on January 17th, 1893, with this false narrative that intervention was necessary in order to secure the rights of American settlers. So the US military single-handedly has caused the most damage to Hawaii. Now this has been a conglomerate effort of both private and public sectors, but the US military has the ability to pollute with impunity. So this word impunity means that there are no consequences for their actions, no matter how egregious they might be. Can you imagine? I mean, it's manifesting itself in climate change, for example, right? There are endless examples across Hawaii and across the world. I want to bring your attention to this piece. It's titled Choice Point by Mishi Klauberg. Mishi is the owner of Wild Harvest and Nectar Cafe here in Hilo, and it was commissioned in honor of the Queen's birthday a couple of years ago. It's an incredibly powerful piece and you can only find it in her cafe. So for all of us here in Hilo, I highly recommend we go check it out. So I'm going to narrow our scope a bit from all of Hawaii to Oahu specifically. So the US military owns nearly 30% of the island of Oahu. They have 12 key military bases and installations across the island. A couple of examples of the horrific contamination that the military has caused. They have dumped thousands of drums of radioactive waste as close as five miles off the coast of Oahu. They've also sprayed the entire island with bacteria to simulate a biological warfare attack. The list absolutely goes on, but to date, probably the most contaminated site, which is a super fun EPA listed site, is the Pearl Harbor Naval Complex. And this place has been further contaminated by one of the most horrific environmental and public safety catastrophes of our lifetime, the Red Hill Crisis. I want to bring your attention to this piece featured here. It's titled, Can Our Tears Clean the Aquifer? It's by Hilo-based artist Makaiwa Kanui. Makaiwa notes, may it spark important conversation and speak to the vai in you. It was also dedicated to all of our kia'i vai, or water protectors, that have been fighting to get this facility decommissioned and defueled since its conception and still fight to this day. So what is the Red Hill Crisis? The Red Hill Crisis is the poisoning of Viola, of water of life, that has resulted from nearly eight decades of the Navy's negligence pertaining to the construction of, the operation of, and the maintenance of the bulk Red Hill fuel storage facility. So cumulatively, this facility has leaked 200,000 gallons of varying types of jet fuel. The two most recent biggest releases were in May and November of 2021, and they were 19,000 gallons and 14,000 gallons consecutively. The artwork featured on this slide is a collaborative piece led by Oahu-based artist Meliana Meyer, and it is a physical manifestation of the pain felt in regards to desecration of Aina. So a, a bit about the Red Hill bulk fuel storage facility. This facility was constructed between 1940 and 1943, so during World War II. And because it was a really rushed design, I'll get into a bit what all the flaws are of it, but it is 20 vertical fuel storage tanks each with a holding capacity of 12.5 million gallons of fuel. So in total, this facility has a holding capacity of 250 million gallons of fuel. The facility is located between Halawa and Moanalua in the Ewa district of Oahu and is a mined cavity into Kapukaki, a sacred mauna. So about this facility, I mentioned it was constructed during wartime, so all of these very irrational decisions were made. Not that that is an uncommon practice when it comes to our military, the US military, not our military. So it resulted in a poor choice of location, only 100 feet over a major basal aquifer that provides fresh water for 400,000 residents on the island of Oahu. 
It has weak long-term building material. So it is only a quarter inch thick steel with cement holding in this poison mined into Kapukaki. And there's also insufficient knowledge about how to actually maintain the physical integrity of these tanks. The method the Navy currently use is inaccurate 40% of the time. So almost half of the time, they are not able to tell whether there is a leak or not. So with those most recent Red Hill spills in mind, I wanted to show everyone a map of all of the impacted communities. So this includes people living on Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam and the surrounding community. I wanna bring your attention to this photo over here on your right, yes. There is a literal sheen coming out of this resident's tap water. You can light the water on fire. It, it's really, really horrific. So everybody in these areas started experiencing ailments like vomiting, diarrhea, severe burning sensations, headaches. Just a few days after the Navy publicly released a statement saying the water was safe for household use. Directly after that Navy statement, Hawaii Department of Health or the HDOH released water quality testing results that indicated the presence of diesel associated hydrocarbons at nearly 350 times the safe amount. That same day, Kia Iwai, those water protectors gathered in Honolulu for a die-in demonstration. But the poisoning continued. Almost exactly one year after that November 2021 spill, the Navy further released 1,300 gallons of aqueous film forming foam, or AFFF concentrate. So AFFF belongs to this group of chemicals called per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And all of these are listed under forever chemicals because of their recalcitrant and bioaccumulative properties. So they are seriously resistant to decay and they build up in the flesh of life really easily. AFFF is known to be a thousand times more toxic than jet fuel and is also linked to the development of multiple types of cancers. Okay, so the contamination happened. What do we do now? Well, the Navy has deployed several insufficient remediation methods based on inadequate sampling and poor modeling. Petroleum remediation technologies to date in general are just often harsh, invasive, and only get part of the job done. The Sierra Club of Hawaii, one of my professional internships, sponsored me to attend a training through the National Environmental Management Academy, or NEMA, on petroleum-based techno remediation technologies for soil, vapor, and groundwater. And so this is really where I gained a better understanding of the current state of remediation technologies. And throughout this course, biorestoration methods or life-based remediation methods were only slightly touched on. And when they were, they talked about two passive-based biomethods. They are monitored natural attenuation and natural source zone depletion. And both of those things are fancy ways of saying, we're gonna leave it to the resident microbes in the soil and groundwater to do their thing and clean up the contamination. And while this can be a very valid method, and a lot of the time the work that I do does rely on those resident fungal and microbial communities to come in and get the work done. But when this much and this toxic, toxic of a contaminant has been released, the passive biorestoration methods are not acceptable. But this is where active biorestoration comes in. So what is biorestoration? Biorestoration is partnering with different forms of life, whether that be plants in phytoremediation, microbial communities in microbial remediation, earthworms in vermicomposting, or fungi in myco-remediation or myco-restoration. I want to bring your attention to two of the photos here. The photo that I'm using, oh, I can't point because of the zoom. Oh, you can see a little bit. So the photo that I'm using to demonstrate microbial remediation are IMOs. These are indigenous microorganisms that were harvested by my good friend, David G. And she harvested them at Ancient Leaf Tea, the farm that we both work at. And then the photo that I'm using to depict my co-remediation was taken up at a lo'i kalo. And so this lo'i up in Kohala was contaminated with around 20 gallons of diesel. And this was taken after biorestoration efforts took place. And so as you can see, that is some healthy, 
happy looking mycelium, indicating really good results. I also want to mention in biorestoration, we always take a multi kingdom approach. In addition to the kingdom of Hawaii, I'm really referring to the different kingdoms of life. So plantae, animalia, protozoa, and so on. And this is because in practice, it's never really just the fungi doing the work. And speaking of never just the fungi doing the work or never just any one person doing the work, all of my, my work and research has been such a team effort. I'm surrounded by people that have dedicated their lives to the balancing and rebalancing and healing of our world. And one of those people is my co-researcher, Sinai Hartman. So Sanai is getting her PhD right now at Penn State, and although my time with the Sierra Club of Hawaii and micro-restoration with Red Hill specifically will not continue in that same way, we are continuing this research as she furthers her dissertation. So most of the work that I'm going to describe was done in tandem with Sanai. So if I say our or we, we know where we're coming from. So what is micro-restoration? This is a huge topic with a lot to cover. And Sanai and I are actually co-teaching a micro-restoration course through Tropical Fungi Academy. And we cover a lot of this. And I can also send that out to people if anybody's interested. But so micro-restoration, micro-remediation is the strategic cultivation of resilient species of fungi. And then after you cultivate those fungi, placing them at contaminated sites in a way where the fungi can molecularly disassemble organic compounds. So really what that means is that saprophytic fungi or those decomposers secrete a variety of digestive enzymes that then break down their food source. So these enzymes have the ability to break down hydrocarbon bonds, which petroleum derived substances have. And then they are able to metabolize any of the nutrients or the simpler forms of carbohydrates or whatever may be left over from that process that they can. Okay, so I'm sure you're all waiting to hear what I did for my professional internships. Um, through a connection with my advisor, Lisa Kanawe, I was connected with Oahu Waterkeeper, Ray Teda Adi'i Chandler Eyal, and she connected me with one of my current mentors, Wayne Tanaka, who is the chapter director for the Sierra Club of Hawaii. And I honestly was so honored because I came into this, like fungi are gonna restore the Aina, and then Wayne was like, yeah, they are. And it was just so lovely that he put all of his faith in both me and the fungi and the incredible team of people that I work with. So my internship with the Sierra Club of Hawaii is really twofold. Part of it was doing back end advocacy work. And then the other part was starting to research and develop ideas of how we can bring micro restoration to the context of Red Hill specifically. So micro-restoration in general is a growing practice across the continent, but even less work has been done here in Hawaii. So we developed a document that both contextualized the Red Hill crisis and came up with original experiments. So in these experiments, we took two species of fungi, a native oyster mushroom species, which is Pleurotus cystidi cystidiosis, we love Latin names, and a naturalized fungi. So Pleurotus dijamor, or the pink oyster. So we have the maple and the pink oyster mushroom. And while native species are always our, our priority, I think there is a lot of lessons that we can take from those that have become naturalized to place. And so becoming naturalized, as in with this fungi, the pink oyster, means that you're not from here, you're here now, and you're providing some of those same ecosystem services and functions that a lot of the native species do without overstepping or being detrimental to that ecosystem. You're really being a contributing member. So we were to grow these two types of fungi on three different invasive hardwood species. So this is really a double whammy restoration, right? Invasive species removal, and then cultivating the either native or naturalized fungus, and then testing these fungi for their remediation capabilities when it comes to petroleum. The three invasive species were strawberry guava, rainbow eucalyptus, and albizia. These experiments were not completed, but this is my life's work and a master's is only two years, so I will be completing these and many more just like this as I continue my huoka'i, my micro-restoration journey here in Hawaii. 
Okay, for the back end advocacy portion of my shutdown Red Hill camp, shutdown Red Hill, shutdown Red Hill campaign is a huge part of that. Um, so we, I wrote testimony, I participated in grant writing, and I even had the opportunity to attend trainings on community organizing. The CR Club sent me to so many trainings. I'm so grateful. One of which was the NEMA, NEMA one that I described earlier. And another one was funding myself and my research partner to go to the first annual Mamama Mushroom Festival. This was last year. And so this year, Sanaya and myself were invited back to be speakers as part of a micro-remediation panel. And I would not have had that opportunity without the Sierra Club. We also did some hands on the ground portions of the Shutdown Red Hill campaign. So Sanaya and I co-designed a community outreach booth for World Oceans Day last summer. And we really wanted to make sure that the Red Hill crisis was talked about in our Hawaii Island community. So what we did is we had everyone from Keiki or children to Kupuna or elders come and talk story about what micro restoration is, how we can apply it to Red Hill and just what the Red Hill crisis is in general. And while we were talking story, everyone made mini mushroom grow kits, which are essentially mini microfilters. So everyone was layering cardboard, coffee, and either brown, brown, pink or blue oyster spawn. And then everyone got to take home each of their mini microfilters and watch as the entire jar became myceliated and then fruited beautiful oyster mushrooms for the entire Ohana to enjoy. I do want to mention that the coffee was donated from Cirque du Latte and Deja Brew, and the cardboard was donated from Hilo Burger Joint and Cruisin Coffee. So big mahalo to them. And this is a photo of everyone's little myco filters that they got to take home. Another hands on the ground portion of this is that we helped coordinate the back end logistics for the Walk for Vi. This was a 3.5 mile walk in support of the Board of Water Supply that happened last December. And around 2000 people showed up. So it was an incredible, powerful, powerful turnout. The photo at the bottom here from your left to right is Sanai, myself in the middle, and then our good friend and fellow mycologist, Manny Diaz, who is based on Oahu. Okay, so my second internship was with Huli Pack, and this really came to be when I met my other mentor, Maki Moronoe, at a sign-waving event for former Senator Laura Acasio. And while Maki is very into micro-restoration, she absolutely sold me on the importance of practicing and participating in activism and advocacy on a much more local level. So my scope really narrowed from Oahu to my resident island, Hawaii Island, and I joined Hulipak. Hulipak stands for Help Uplift Leaders with Integrity, and we do this by endorsing Pono candidates that have a clear track record of community engagement or decision-making that is just best for all life here in Hawaii. We also seek to uplift community members, to elect Pono leaders, and to inspire social, economic, and environmental well-being. And it's with Hulipak that I really feel I took leadership of my political activism and I went officially or I moved officially from the role of advocate to activist. And honestly, Maki was a huge part of lighting that fire. So in Hulipak, I am on the core and endorsement committees and I'm also chair of the communications committee. I write and submit testimony, track bills, meet with local news outlets like Honolulu Civil Beat, interview in incoming candidates and even do social media management. And I'm laughing at this last part, especially for my family tuning in from back home because I'm the worst young person when it comes to social media management and those type of related things. So while I think that picking up to things like how the legislature works came super easily, when it came to social media, it was absolutely a learning curve. <laughs> this screenshot to your right over here of me and the sweet bee, my dog, is one of my social media things that I made, and it was a video supporting SB 1458. This is a bill that relates to extended producer responsibility, and unfortunately, it did not make it out of the Senate, but there are several environmental bills just like this in the workings for the upcoming 2024 legislative session. Through Bullypack, I also had the opportunity to attend a Chamber of Sustainable Commerce bill writing session. 
So the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce is a new chamber created by former Commissioner Kim Koko Iwamoto, and it's really geared towards moving businesses to a more sustainable business model in all the ways, whether that be their packaging or their economic model. So it's a really incredible new chamber, and I highly recommend we check it out. I also found myself at this bill writing session sitting among professionals from all different fields and talking about what bills we would like to see receive a lot of support and get pushed through the next session and also talk about amendments and what we'd like to see change. Okay, so what's next? I'm still going to continue with my activism and advocacy. I am currently on the boards for Huli Pack, Recycle Hawaii, and CR Club Hawaii Island Group. Also through the support of in my incredible mentors and all of my incredible communities, um, Sanai and I will be co-founding an organization called Laboratory to Landscape, where we actually go out and implement these biorestoration practices across the Aina. I have so much mahalo to give. A huge mahalo nui to my mentors, Wayne Tanaka and Maki Moranoe, my advisor, Lisa Kanale, my life partner and research partner, Sanai Hartman, and all of my incredibly supportive cohort, community, ohana, friends, and of course, to Hawaii herself. Your aloha, your teachings, and your gifts have been absolutely unequaled. Mahalo nui. Woo. Woo, we have time for questions. That's so exciting because we didn't know if we would. Um, so. Oh yeah, I'm seeing a lot of AOs. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I don't know how to mask for it. All right, so um, uh, audience on Zoom, if you have a question, you can either type in the chat or just shout it out. And audience uh, here live, if you have a question, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll, we'll um, Will you monitor you? this? Sure, because yeah, I don't yeah, know how to have the mouse. Yeah. Oh, you too. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. You. Oh, um, I didn't even take water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, we've got a very silent audience right now. I know. Oh, before I answer your question, um, email me, reach out. Let's talk about all of these things. And I'm also involved in so many projects across our Moku, our island, and other ones. So I would love to get the word out there. And I had a 30 minute time window, so I really just packed it all in. But go ahead, Avalon. I'm just curious what first got you into uh, microremediation? Like, oh my goodness. Start? Yay, start story. Okay, so during my undergrad, Sanai was just starting her master's and we were like, she doesn't know what she wants to do for it. And the Mycological Society up in Humboldt on Unseated We Outland was hosting this event where this mycoremediator, Lee Von Durr, one of our mycology mentors with Fungaya Farms, also up on Unseated We Outland, was presenting on microremediation. And without giving too much of his background, he was like, yeah, barely finished high school. And now I just remediated a, a football sized field full of human waste. And I was like, what? That's a thing? And so since then, Sanai decided that was what she was gonna do for her master's thesis. And I was her co-researcher. And then me starting my master's here, then we moved on and brought it more to the context of Hawaii. So in the Pacific Northwest, we mostly worked with fungi in the capacity for wastewater treatment. Um, working with Stropharia rugosolosa, we gotta work on our Latin, but our alelo is getting there. Um, yeah, and then so the common garden giant, incorporating that into wastewater treatment facilities to increase their capacity. And then moved here and Red Hill happened and we were like, I think fungi can kind of address petroleum derived contaminants, right? And by no means are we claiming we know how to remediate an aquifer, but we want biorestoration and micro-remediation specifically to at least be part of that remediation conversation because it's often overlooked and viewed as pseudoscience to the Western world. And so we're also trying to change that narrative. Good question, Adam. Yeah. All right, any additional questions? Audience at home? All right, with that then, we'll yeah. give you a big thank you. Yeah.